So I've uh, never had a slow clap before, by the way, so thanks. Um, last time I was here, 2013, uh, talking to TEDx Cape Town, um, I, I had a title, Transforming Healthcare Through Need-Driven Design. And uh, I spoke about us as tool makers, very technocentric, despite the need-driven design element. And I also talked about the world's first open source metabolic chamber that we built to help us in our research. And during these three years, you would have seen headlines like Stellenbosch's LifeQ in big tie-up with Garmin, LifeQ, Analog Devices, which is a big semiconductor company, to collaborate on non-invasive body monitoring. You'll see Garmin tweeting something like, joins with LifeQ. What about TomTom? We still partners with TomTom as well. We've just, uh, with them, uh, released new technology, three new devices out containing of some of the LifeQ technology. And it says here, our testing showed the TomTom Spark to be the most accurate optical heart rate tracker that have been put through wearables tests. So we, we're making a dent, and you will not read this publicly anywhere, but we've also raised a series one of $20 million. And I will tell you more about that. And uh, the fort fortune through this journey that a very distinguished artist and photographer, Gregor Rerich, followed our journey and took pictures of us and me, where we traveled. And, and I'm going to tell this story through pictures. So the story is about when two wellness journeys collide. And it's about my own wellness journey and the journey of our company towards solving global healthcare and wellness crises around the world. So um, around the time I gave the TEDx talk last time, we were looking for a new office space, and we found this building very excited. Our team burst out of its seams, and we got a new home. We were still in a, in a little house in Stellenbosch when, when I gave the talk. And we were at that time developing new sensors. And by the way, I want you to look at my own physique through this, you will not miss it in any way. <laughs> we were busy building new sensors, building new algorithms. You will see I'm wearing an eye patch there. I included this picture because, um, yeah, I lost my eyes. I crossed paths with the healthcare system at the age of 10 months already um, with a, ca a childhood cancer called retinoblastoma. So I have a, a huge um, amount of, of respect and I. I really believe in what the healthcare system does, but there's a lot of things broken in the broader healthcare system that I would also like to talk about. Talked about avenues that we took that didn't work out that well. We constantly looked for new technologies, new sensors that we've developed, new algorithms. We started doing work in the cloud. This was at a team session where we were just doing a planning for new sensors, for new algorithms, for new ways to tap into the human body. That was our, shall I say, coming out party at CES, January 2015. And this was uh, me giving a talk at CES about LifeQ and what, we, what we're about. This was in May, evaluating algorithms. You can see I'm not getting smaller. Um, <laughs> evaluating algorithms. And uh, things were looking really, really good. In May, there you can see we evaluating final algorithms to re be released with a, with a team. And in August, we already started doing new sensor development, only to have product release uh, by TomTom in October of that year. That was our team then. So it grew. Our team is about double this now, scattered all across the world. Um, and there I'm doing what I love doing, talking and telling people about, about this, about what we do. And there I'm talking to investors much, much bigger than what I'm now. And, uh, and obviously this, this led me to think, because I've, I've gone through this cycle a few times in my life, and I just said, listen, I... I want to be kind to myself this time around. I'm not going to deprive myself. I'm not going to do this again. This whole thing of counting your calories, of restricting yourself, it only works that well. So I did what I 
did best, and I started drawing schematics and, and figuring this out. And I got to these rather strange pictures. I'm a systems biologist. I love drawing pictures of systems. And um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I knew that my biochemistry was, effect, uh, was causing my, the state of satisfaction to go to hunger. I knew that created discomfort. And I knew if food was there, hand would go, and it would, it would trigger that sympathetic, parasympathetic, and all these nervous responses. And I would grab it, and I would eat it. Food will come in, and it would satisfy that hunger, and I would get less discomfort. But then you go on a diet, and you take some of that discomfort, and you push it into that willpower bucket. But guess what? This is a slow process. It doesn't work for very long. And then you just yo-yo. So I said I need to do an experiment. I need to forget about weight loss. I need to focus on food and what is good for me fundamentally, what's good for my longevity, good for my general health. So I decided to cluster food into what's disease-promoting and disease-preventing foods. And what I saw is something very interesting, that there's a slow cycle, a much slower cycle that within about two, three weeks, my sense of deprivation disappeared. I had uh, gut promotion, my gut flora got promoted, the natural balances, I got the real, the right foods in, and I just felt amazing. For the first time in my life, my weight came down and my sense of deprivation. I started feeding myself probiotics and I started eating all the stuff that my research showed. And during that time, I might say during that contemplative time where you saw me sitting, a key part of that was because our team was just pouring data onto me, showing me all these relative risks um, that I'm imposing on myself. And our data is continuous, very compelling evidence that, listen, I'm, I'm not going to last long if I go this, this route. Um, so I started eating foods that I thought, I'm doing myself a favor. I'm kind to myself if I do this. People tell me now, are you, are you at least taking a cheat day on occasion? I say, hell no. Why would I do it, take a cheat day? Because I'm then taking a day of absence from being kind to myself. <laughs> this is being kind to yourself. It's eating consciously. And I, avocados became my best friend. Um, and I, I, I took a lot of pictures because I, I wanted to document this journey. It's important to, for me at least to document these journeys, and I love making beautiful food. I started staying in Airbnbs, rather cook than stay in hotels, and I just love cooking, by the way, so why not? It's good therapy. Um, there you can see some more meals, all self-made meals, these. And I just love to eat these days what I can see on my plate. There's some more that I didn't make myself, but that was very good. <laughs> um, but so my weight loss went from 134 kilograms to 79, and my sense of deprivation just disappeared in the process. I felt healthful. And guys, this, this really was not... Not it, not even the dramatic result. I mean, this, was, this is a before and after picture, and, and you always need this before and after picture. But this was, for me, the dramatic result. I, still back at the beginning phases where I did not have access through APIs to all our tech, I used some other, like my fitness pal and so, to lock some of these things, and, and my heart rate, within two, three weeks, came down from 80 and it dropped down to about 48. My, our team modeled my survival based on all these cardiorespiratory elements, and we have these things available through our APIs now and pushing it into the broader ecosystem. Well, you can see I would have probably had some other chronic disease and die at 64 without intervention. Pushing that all the way up to 85, I would just say every time I eat, what I eat now, I just feel so kind to myself. I feel that, listen, Rian, you're doing this because you really love yourself. So it's a different objective than wanting to lose weight. It's being really kind to, to my body. 
So this was, I started traveling, I had high energy levels, uh, I still drink wine. This was arriving from an overseas trip. But guys, I, I literally said I need to figure out how this healthcare system ties together. And, and I went only with a bag, I got rid of all my other stuff, and I started traveling the world. I dropped down my stuff to that, what you can see there. You will see I have a scale with me and uh, a lot of other interesting things. That was it. Um, I still travel with this, by the way. I arrived a day, the evening before yesterday from San Diego with this. And uh, I've learned so much. This was me in London, in Italy, at the fortune of that was busy doing a Zoom call with someone. The world is really now flat in terms of how technology has enabled us. And I came back and I shared my learnings with the team. This was in Onres. Shared all these new learnings. I painted with the team. And I had, I had such a resolve because I, 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 I know we're onto something. We figured something out. And I want to share this with you as well. Quite a complicated picture, but this is a very important picture. It is the individual or the patient here at the bottom goes to the care provider to get care reactively. There is on the left hand side you have a, a current state of health and you can have an improved or a deteriorated state of health. And there's only two things that you can do to a human body to access that state of health. You can look at it through very costly mechanisms, tests and things, and then you can intervene in very expensive ways. And clinicians use all these, these different tools, clinical interventions they are called. The problem with this is, and how things work is the individual would go to the insurer, give the insurer money, so I want to buy insurance, and then the health insurer would pay everyone in this ecosystem who needs money. The problem with this, and Peter Ortsack was one of the guys that uncovered this, is the healthcare system in its current state, sure, administration costs hike the fees, aging hikes the fees, but the biggest contributor was not, it was not despite technology, it was because of technology. Technology being pushed, very expensive technologies being pushed into the clinical intervention space, very cutting edge disease detection techniques that the physician would obviously choose because it's in your interest. So the science and tech just push new things in and what does that do? It inevitably hikes costs and it inevitably hikes demands. People got a false sense of re reassurance that I can wait. I can wait until I'm chronically diseased and then go and get the healthcare system to sort me out. I will drink my statin. I will drink my blood pressure medication. And that's why you see the very recently discoveries, Adrian Gore, on why medical aid costs are soaring and why medical aid is so expensive. But there's an alternative. And this is, this is very compelling evidence, guys. Life expectancy increase as health expect, uh, expenditure increases. But just look at the United States, for instance. This really fragmented system where people are, are so reliant on the healthcare system. 89 or something ridiculous, almost nine out of 10 dollars spent in the healthcare system is spent towards chronic disease that could have been prevented. We are all crippling that system. We're all making it impossible for poor people to get healthcare because of this high cost. And, and that knowledge alone already, apart from the love for yourself, should already drive you to make more conscious decisions on your health. So in order to do that, our company is all about saying we're not pushing our tech necessarily in these, these bottom, the bottom more traditional healthcare ecosystem. We are pushing it through a de-identified and user-driven switch Get these continuous measures, this Garmin device, all these continuous streams of behavioral, environmental, and continuous information. Let's give it to the user. Let's put the individual behind the steer. And as part of this initiative, this was drawn on an airplane, by the way, so there's a bit of light and things not, not good. Um, <laughs> but uh, 
you can see LifeCube plays a key role in enabling that information access and also then taking that information and making it available to an ecosystem. In addition, we get forward-thinking reinsurers, insurance companies, analytics guys, user engagement apps, all the people currently engaging with the individual. And we rallied them behind this idea. And, and I've been overwhelmed by, to, to say, the, um, the reception that we've gotten to put the, the user, the individual, the human behind the steering wheel. People talk about preventative medicine. People talk about participative. Participative is, for me, a very paternalistic word. It's, again, us in the driver's seat, and you can participate. It is user-centric. The user is at the core of all of this. But let it also be a warning. If you're behind the steer, you better take that steering wheel. You better take control of your health. And this information that we will provide you, you need to, to really start taking that understanding and making good health decisions, not to be kind to yourself, but also to the general ecosystem. So we're anticipating other analytics providers already getting some on board, AI, machine learning guys, and we know some people will not be able to afford this technology. And we're looking forward to push it to governments and to, to corporates to, to adapt their policies, to be more humane, to be more in tune with what we need to be healthy. So we just this week we released a pilot with a, a, a big South African insurer. Um, I'm, there will probably be an announcement very soon. Here you can see the, the devices that we're rolling out. I gave a talk with a user engagement partner, TickTrack and Garmin, at Health 2.0 two weeks ago about this. And we, we can even get your raw data from these devices. And you'll see if we stratify, for instance, your raw pulse wave that tells you quite a lot about the individual's cardiac system. And we stratify these waves. This is a bunch of people's waves. We stratify it from blue young people, orange old people. And you'll see there as the, the, the point goes up, you know, as the curve goes up, you'll see how the blue and the orange segregate, that you can, through the data, already see what a person's expected age is. Some people are slightly ahead. Some are behind that expected chronological age that we can read on your birth certificate. We will provide these things that it's a message to you to know whether you're ahead or behind this curve. We provide, as part of this pilot, we provide stress information. And I, it's beautiful. I can see my stress information literally superimposed over my tough meetings. I will look at my TEDx uh, talk as well, but I'm actually quite enjoying this, by the way. <laughs> um, heart rate, max heart rate, all these different things that people need. Very important also to gauge healthcare. Uh, sleep. This is being presented through the company TickTrack. We can track your breathing rate through these devices within two beats per minute at night. Your sleep apnea, we can track whether someone has sleep apnea or not. I'm not even going to go through all these things. We can track whether someone is onset of atrial fibrillation or suffering from that. And we will provide these things through this broad ecosystem because we really like to, 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 to expand our scale and our reach through companies. And Esther Dyson said it very well. She said... Health should be viewed as an asset that you invest in instead of waiting for it to decline and making repairs. And I have to boast, since I was on a panel with her two, three weeks ago, and it was such an amazing privilege, amazing woman, Esther Dyson. And, 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 and I know this to be true, but I also know we need to enable people, and people need to do two things. They need to inform themselves. We can help with that. And that's what Life Q Mission is, to really... Inform you, inform you on the e on, on, and the ecosystem to inform you on, on what's good, where you are in your health journey, but you better take that steer and take control of your own health. And you can only do that by being kind to yourself. I send an email out to um, our chief commercial officer about a LifeQ team retreat, and, and I got one Liner email, she loves one-liners, but I got this one-liner back saying, the only other vital thing I believe humans need is love. And I can tell you guys, who would have, 
Yeah, I, I mean, I'm so in debt. I just want to say I love our team. This is Nashina. There's my plate of healthy food again. Um, and uh, I don't compromise on that. People need to. This is not something you, you don't compromise on kindness to yourself. Uh, this is the other founders that I've traveled the world with. That's me a year ago with the other founding team members, Franco, Cora, Lori. Um, Lori, I need to just point out, this is my usual view of him. He's my business partner. He's my friend. Um, I love this guy and vice versa. It's, it's a business marriage. And, and I tell you guys this, I measure all my business relationships against my relationship to this guy. This is the guy that's making this journey possible, and he's our leader in our company. And uh, with that, who would have known, I took this picture in London, who would have known it was there on the wall, right next to me, the answer. And I want to leave you with a quote from Adiba, and I want to also leave this specifically to the technologists and scientists out there. For to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. I would urge you, listen to your own body, be kind to yourself, listen to others, be kind to them. I'm going to more and more employ this in my own company, in my own team, to, to, to just employ this as a general rule of thumb. You will be pleasantly surprised by the outcomes. Thank you.